able to get idea how to find tps key in float number and all can you elaborate yeah see i have explained that a uh, couple of students and also we discussed in the class so i would suggest that uh, you talk to yashdeep or keval about it they are pretty much aware of uh, how to do it yes please i just talked with yesterday, uh, yesterday yesterday and i got the brief idea i got the brief idea about the project okay so i will elaborate with the rest of the students yeah because uh, what is happening is uh, to be very honest it was supposed to be a group exercise uh, before the lockdown so i was expecting you guys to do projects in a group of two Uh, so that you can figure out some of the issues uh, along with it, but uh, because of the lockdown and proximity issues, doing it as a single project. And uh, the good thing is that uh, this way you guys are learning more, uh, trying to figure out everything by yourself. But yes. talk to each other and try to help out. And if there is an unresolved issue. Uh, we will definitely look into it. I'll, I'll help you. You can text. Me. Yes, actually. Yesterday, yes, plus uh, Chaitanya did. They they both have a lot of knowledge about it, and I uh, learned quite a few things. So I I will be available to help even others. Good. We can nominate Chaitanya as one of the problem solvers when it comes to projects like this. माइक माइक्रोफोन ऑफ एज लॉन्ग एज योर आई मीन एज लॉन्ग एज योर यू डोंट हैव टू मच डिस्टेंस अराउंड ओके सो बिफोर आई प्रोसीड विद द परमिशन आई वांट टू टॉक लिटिल बिट अबाउट द लास्ट पार्ट ऑफ योर प्रोजेक्ट डीलिंग विद रिस्क manage project i have a pdf file to sharing with you problem so i just want to turn off the microphone for 5 10 minutes and i'll ask you to turn on when i have you all so we are taking a project uh and let's say this are the different scenarios i will talk to the first case who is an ir of 21% most like 15% worst case is 9% and this is the probability distribution for all the three cases and so uh, going by that probability we are having an expected value of 14.7 on this particular project and here the example is for an apartment building so <clears throat> if we choose some other project <coughs> or if we choose an apartment or a residential building with a different uh, marketing mix it could be a 4 bhk instead of a 3 bhk or it could a uh, one bedroom again you would get a different scenario uh in this case uh because it was also a commercial property uh this example also does it for a shopping center which is a commercial project and in this case the <clears throat> the irrs for best case were 17% 14% 
14.6% and 13.2%. And the, <coughs> excuse me, guys. the probability was 10%, 80%, and 10%. And so the uh, weighted average again came out to be the same, which is 14.7%. So you have a scenario here where you have two different cash flow models. And in both the cash flow models, after the probability assignment, the expected value is same, which is 14.7%. So how do you go about choosing which project is more risky and which one is less risky? And this can happen many times. Uh, there are also situations where this may not exactly 14 points, I mean, it may not be exactly the same, but it may be very close to each other. You know, you could have an expected value of 56% and in other case, you could have an expected value of 54%. So it is so close that you would be thinking, okay, uh, I mean, my profit margin and my internal rate of return and my NPV is very close to each other. Still, I would like to choose a project which is less risky. And one of the ways to do it visually, visually, uh, is by just assessing what is the spread on those values. So like this spread of 9% to 21%, that is 9% is the worst case scenario, and 21% is the best case scenario. This is for the apartment building <clears throat> with an expected value of 14.7. I have not put the value of most likely. I have just taken the expected value as most likely. Whereas for the shopping center, the worst case is 13.2% and uh, the best case is 17%. So you can see that the spread or rather the angle or what we call variance and standard deviation. Visually, you can see that uh, this project is less risky compared to a huge variance of 9% or a swing of 9% to 21% in case of uh, the apartment building. So here visually we are uh, convinced that Doing a shopping center project would be uh, less less risky, but sometimes even visually, uh, you may not have uh, a very good understanding of how how if, uh, which one is less risky. I mean, if I was to take a small example, uh, let me share this scenario where you could have. A spread uh, for a project which is something like this where uh, this is the worst case and this is the best case and you could have another project uh, which could have a spread which will look something like this it looks something like this so visually you don't know you know that uh, the, the second project has maybe higher end but you don't know which one is better so so coming back to this original file we're talking about uh, you may have to do something that is called the sensitivity analysis. Uh, and before you proceed to sensitivity analysis, you can do the basic variance and standard deviation measure for them so that you can assess the risk. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to take the same value for both the projects. So for the apartment building, you have uh, best case, most likely worst case, this was your spread, 9% to 21%. And 
can we take the expected value? Uh, fourteen point seven, and we take the difference. Difference is twenty one minus fourteen point seven. You get six point two. Here you get zero point three. Here you get a difference of minus uh, five point seven. And you square the difference. You take this difference and you square it. So a square of six point three would give you thirty nine point six nine, zero point zero nine, and thirty two. So these are the differences. And because this is negative, the difference will make it positive. And then you have your original probabilities. The original that you had for this project was fifteen percent, fifty five percent, and uh, and you multiply this difference here with this, and then you will have a weighted uh, variance for all the three scenarios 5.9, 0 0.05. And when you add this up, you'll get the variance of project as 12.5. Sorry, not percent, you just get a variance of 12.5. And the standard deviation would be the square root of this variance. You take square root of this, and you will get your standard deviation value for this part. The standard deviation for apartment is 3.5, and uh, for shopping center, um, I'm going to use the same data that we had. Your original possible IRRs in three scenarios, your expected value of 14.7. You take the difference, uh, you get the difference here, and you multiply it by your original probability assessment. And again, you get a weighted variance. And here, the variance is 0 0.76, and the standard deviation, which is the square root, is 0 0.86. So, as a thumb rule, the project which has lower star standard deviation is less risky. But there is other concept of normal distribution. And uh, you might want to read this. I'm not going to go in detail with this. Uh, it's about getting 95% confidence level on your normal distribution curve. And uh, it shows the basic ranges of expected value and IRR where they should form. And so for both the projects, it's been given. Uh, you don't need to go so deep into it because we are not taking a statistics class. But if you're interested, after reading this, there is a lot of information on online on how to do the sensitivity analysis and how you can further uh, get an exact idea about the risk. Uh, that your project would have. Uh, but for the uh, purpose of this class, we can stop here. I mean, you can stop here and even for your project, it would be nice if you can calculate the standard deviation and variance for the cash flows of uh, all the three scenarios. And if you're doing a comparative analysis, like if you are calculating uh, for a 2 BHK residential versus a 3 BHK, then this would be even more important because then you are showing two possible options uh, that you can do in this project. Uh, in which case, uh, even if you're doing a mixed project compared to a pure commercial project, compared to a pure residential project, you will have three uh, project possibilities. And each project possibility would have three scenarios, most likely worst case, best case. In total, you have nine scenarios. And uh, the best way to compare them would be by using this uh, method of uh, probability uh, assignment, uh, calculation of variance, and calculation of standard deviation. Okay. I don't expect you to plot the normal distribution curves on each. You don't need to do that. Is not in this particular course. Okay, so I am going to stop this. Uh, and let's uh, 
come back to our original path. Okay. okay so um, let's begin today's session uh, where I want to talk about uh, project permissions and. Uh, Chrome. I think it is open in Chrome. Look at the original presentation. So today I want to talk about uh, building permissions uh, for real estate project tools. Okay. And I would like to pause here for a minute. Uh, if you guys have any questions regarding what we just talked, you can ask. If you didn't understand anything, if you had any doubt for the standard deviation variance. Okay, so I expect once I share that file with you, you guys would be able to very clearly. Uh, so, okay, uh, and I believe my audio is yeah. much clear this time. Hello, yes. Hello. Yeah, somebody has a question. Yes, sir. Yeah. Ask. So I am having a commercial project. Okay. So I tried to make a cash flow, but uh, due to some lack of like uh, realistic data, mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, I'm much more higher. I'm having much more higher. Like uh, the for the best, it's two fifty around two fifty. Okay. So like I can explain the concept, but uh, I cannot uh, like. Uh, Perfectly get that I have for the project. So, is it okay? Well, you might want to cross check your calculation. That is the first thing you want to do. Uh, you want to ensure that you are, uh, you input the right discount rate and your cash flow calculation is right. That is the first thing you need to do. Because an IRR of 250 is really very high. Uh, secondly, you could have underestimated the value of land and you could have overestimated the value of sale in terms of price. Sir, uh, the, yes, the data of land and uh, the like uh, for the construction and the, for the units are real. Okay. But the like, uh, but the uh, time period is very less. Like uh, I've taken two years, two and a half years. So, no, two and a half years, the two years is a realistic time period. See, I will tell you one small so problem that Excel has. In Microsoft Excel, if your total number of cash flows exceed 30, okay, so if it exceeds mm -hmm. 2.5 years, there is some error. Mm -hmm. I mean, it has a limitation of, uh, that is a limitation of Excel. Uh, if you are not comfortable using other software like SPSS, SAS, uh, you can do this calculation in those statistical software. But so, if we, because we are using Excel, which is a very common tool, I would suggest mm -hmm. do not have cash flow numbers more than 50, 30 is something like 2.5 years. So, yes. your project uh, is realistic. What you can do, you can email me. Or WhatsApp me your calculated file, uh, send me in a okay. personal message, and I will mm -hmm. have a look at it and I'll give you my feedback. Okay. Okay. Anyone else who has this kind of a problem where the IRR is so high that you are uh, worried if uh, your calculation is wrong, uh, you can message. Okay, thank you. Uh, so shall we proceed? What happened? Okay, let's go ahead. Okay. Is there any other question anyone has? Ha huh, double? No, sir. Okay, okay. So let's go ahead with the uh other aspects of 
uh, other permissions that you need uh, for approval. And I take this uh, building bylaws, project permission, all is the part of marketing and finance because they are closely related. Uh, this would ideally fall into the category of taxation, uh, which is a form of, uh, which is a part of finance. Because I had questions in the past where students asked me, "Sir, why are you teaching building bylaws and permissions in the finance class? We should have covered this in the urban planning class." And the fact is that. Uh, this has a huge impact on your financial numbers okay and that is the reason why uh, we are covering this uh, in the finance just to clarify okay so uh, in india at a local level local level is in india at the state level at the level of uh, your city you have three tier approval process. Okay, there are three tiers. Actually, there are four tiers, but the fourth tier is about NOCs, which are no objection certificates. So, I have not classified that as an approval, but uh, I'm classifying these three categories as the biggest tier of approval. And the first one is uh, you need to get your project approved from RERA. And before you can go to RERA, Let's talk about at a local level what approvals you need. And so, the first foremost approval that you will need is from the land revenue department. And uh, despite choosing a land which is a part of the urban area, despite the land having a town planning scheme and a final plot number. The land is not classified as a NA land or a non-agricultural land. It may still be an agricultural land. And so your first step would be to convert that agricultural land into a non-agricultural land. There have been cases within a town planning scheme where after the readjustment and after allotting a final plot, despite having some buildings around them, some people, some there have been some cases in Gujarat, they have refused to construct a real estate project and continued farming. Okay, because it is still an agricultural land, which is rare. It is just the pressure of the urban development when developers approach such a farmer that look, your land is now a part of the urban settlement. And you better convert this into an NA. I'm interested in buying. So one is the conversion of your land from agriculture to non-agriculture. That is one big approval that you need. Secondly, of course, is the ownership. That is, you need to transfer that land on the name of your name or the cooperative housing society. You need to register it and you need to pay stamp duty on it. This we have talked. Uh, third would be any measurement corrections that could be there, like the 712 records or the records of revenue might show 2800 square meters, while on actual site it would be uh, 3000 square meters. What do you do if there is such a variation? Well, in that case, uh, uh, your town planning would have taken minor care of it when they measure but if they also make a mistake you want to ensure that uh, your land measurement corrections are right because your fsi your profit everything will depend on it and so you will get it surveyed also and corrected in the land revenue department report that is very important uh, and uh, any payments that you are doing for agricultural land, uh, that is something you have to ensure that the past payments are done. Otherwise, your project will be stalled if you do not pay your revenue. Okay. Or in the past, it has been not paid by the previous one. So, your second uh, tier of approval would be the 
municipal corporation or union and again i am referring to gujarat state because other states would have a corporation but their uda would be different because here the udas are governed by the ud act of 1976 and uda could be gandhinagar could be uda for ahmedabad it could be oda for sigur it could be jaipur and here you need to first get your plans approved okay so your drawing so you need to hire an architect or an engineer who will prepare a design for the project and uh, this drawings have to be sanctioned from the corporation or the ud based on the building bylaws building bylaws include things like having the right margins having the right setback ensuring the height of the building does not exceed the minimum uh, maximum per- permissible limit ensuring that uh, all the other aspects of the building code are taken care of and once that is done uh, your plans are approved you can proceed ahead with something we call the development permit and development permission is the permission they give you that yes you can now start constructing the project so this will happen so you will get a development permission and once this two things are done you would go to rera with all the project details and you would register your project <clears throat> and here there are three types of registration one is the registration of the builder developer himself who is developing this project second would be the registration of the broker if you are hiring or assigning brokers for this project who will sell or who has the authority to sell this project exclusively they need to get registered and third is the registration of the project itself so there are two registrations required one is the developer registration this is a one time process once you de- register as a developer in future you can do as number of projects you want as long as this is not expire uh, someone told me this registration needs to be renewed every 5 years uh, in some states in it is 10 years uh, the validity and then you can do a number of projects under that registration and this, the other registration is the project registration for that particular project that you are doing you need to pay a certain fees for that and of course you need to provide construction finance availability of 70% in a bank account to get this project registered once your project is complete it's done you will have to seek something called the building use use certificate or occupancy certificate it from the corporation or you just wherever your project is falling in so that is another uh, set of approval that you need uh, before your customers or buyers can actually move into the apartment or the house or the commercial building that you have constructed so occupancy certificate is a must but this is available on completion and usually you will not get this uh, until all the finances has been paid up none of your taxes should be pending okay because there is something called betterment charge we talked about town planning scheme in f form uh, before you get the development permission you have to pay that betterment charge so you won't get development permission until you pay that similarly until all your vera obligations are not completed and uh, you will not get the bu certificate and before you get the bu certificate there are a set of noc that you need to procure in some cases you need to get uh, nocs before bu but those can be attained after development permission and then there are some nocs that you have to get uh, before getting the development We'll talk about it in the upcoming slide. 
then there is another uh, approval required it's called impact duty regular regularization so this particularly applies to uh, projects that are going into redevelop now we will take have, i'll just give you a small example let's imagine there was a society that was constructed 30 years back and during the course of time uh, the residents of the society have made lot of illegal construction like they covered the parking they covered the terrace they extended the balconies and overall fsi that was allowed for that building increased by the residents themselves of course then the so the zone changed the fsi was increased but technically whatever more area they had constructed was illegal so now as a developer if you are considering buying this or you know redeveloping this project the first step would be you have to submit the exact major drawing plans of the society as they are and if there is any irregular construction that has taken place you have to pay impact duty or you need to regularize it before you demolish it which is strange otherwise you will not get the development permit and there is one more aspects of redevelopment permit for to take it and that is ground zero and this is very crucial what this means is that imagine if you are redeveloping a society uh, or a housing colony which has 10 towers and each tower has 50 residents let's say that so there are 500 families staying and there are total 10 towers okay now when you go to seek the development permission you cannot get permission in phases so if you can tell them that look we are going to demolish tower 1 and 2 first uh, the remaining towers c d e f g h i j those towers are going to stay and after demolishing tower a and b uh, we will construct phase 1 of our project and then once that is over we will proceed to demolishing the other tower so you cannot do that phase wise what this means is that you need ground zero as in you need to demolish the entire project before you can get the development permit and that puts a huge financial burden and huge social burden for the developer he will have to figure out how can i relocate this 500 families for a period of two years or three years on rent somewhere else before they can move back here and then i can maybe benefit uh, by adding more built up here and that is the reason why a society is not getting redeveloped the way they should be what is happening is uh, people are selling off their apartments to the developer at a fixed price and they're moving out to a new property otherwise technically redevelopment would mean that i want to still stay here in a better and a bigger house you keep the profit but give me a bigger house i don't want money and and that is the the problem is because all municipal corporation across india across india require Uh, a ground zero situation before you can go for the develop and i think an amendment here would be important uh, for the sustainable approaches that we can have in this okay i'm pausing for a couple of minutes if anybody has any question regarding this three year approval you can ask no questions shall we proceed sir how is the mehsul tax calculated for a plot yeah so the mehsul tax is uh, something that you pay uh, 
at the time of when the land was an agricultural land so you have to see the 712 form the sat bara of that particular land and in there there is something written as akar and akar means the tax that you have to pay and that you have to pay based on what agricultural crops are you growing there so if you are growing wheat bajri you know there are many kinds of crops there is a, a kharif crop and then there is a rabai crop and whether there is irrigation available whether the land is peat land non peat land but based on the quality of land quality of soil and what you are growing your mahsool will be decided on that so as a builder you don't have to pay but if you are converting an agricultural land into a non agricultural land and if your previous owner has not paid for it uh you may have problem in getting the na certificate non agricultural certificate and then at that time you might have to pay on his behalf yes okay sir obaidullah do you have a question no question okay let's go ahead okay so uh, i just very uh, quickly wanted to talk about uh, new rera rules which you may be interested in is you can only sell a property based on carpet area and if you look at your project all your calculations are based on super built up area is it true so yeah so uh, but you can only sell based on the carpet area so a lot of students still don't know the difference between the super built up area the built up area and the carpet area and so i have one slide dedicated to that very simple definition see the super built up areas as we talked earlier are the areas which includes your whatever unit you are selling to the customer including terraces corridors staircases all amenities provided and you divide that equally among all the units that's your super built up area sba the so built up area is the one that is usually considered for the fsi calculation and the built up area includes within the housing unit that is within your apartment or your office uh, an exterior wall because walls take up an area uh, projections take up an area partition walls take up that area so that's a built up area and the carpet area is the area where you can actually have a carpet on which is excluding the area of the walls internal and external walls projections and balconies balconies are not counted towards uh, carpet area but they are counted towards built up area so that's the basic difference between the three is there anyone who did not understand this shall i go ahead so your project calculation has the sba and the built up it does not have the carpet and if you want to know the conversion what the, how much is the uh, you know forward loading and backward loading for carpet well it is 15% backward from your built up area if you remove 15% from built up area you will get the carpet it can be 15 to 20% depending on how much balconies are provided and if the walls are thicker things like that but usually it is 15 to 20 percent so if you are going forward again you know the calculation reverse loading calculation and you would do that the same way you did for this two okay let's uh, quickly talk about the 10 things i was talking about of which are those 10 things which are not included in the Floor space index. Okay, so these are the ten things uh, within your project that are not 
included in FSI or FAR. And this is as per the general control development regulation of all cities in Gujarat. This does not apply to other states. Other states have different provisions. So I am talking mostly about Gujarat. So let's begin. Uh, the first is all the parking spaces without any enclosures uh, with a clear height of not more than 2.8 meters from the beam bottom. So the height uh, in the parking spaces from the beam bottom should not be more than 2.8 meters. So if you have provided such a parking, that will not be counted towards effort. Secondly, spaces of hollow plane with a uh, maximum clear height of 2.8 meters, okay, including uh, in the residential buildings or a mixed development at ground level without any enclosure walls and parking. Does everybody know what hollow plane is? I can demonstrate that for you. What is hollow plane? Uh, let me go here. I'm just, I'll try to explain you what explain this. Uh, if, if you have a, this is a, going to be a very bad sketch, so please bear with me. But if, if you have, so if this is your building, okay, if this is your building and if these are your columns, and we would assume that this is the ground level, okay, this is the ground level. And you know these columns go deeper. You know these columns will go deeper, right? You know that. They go much deeper inside uh, the building with your isolation and all the footings that you have. Uh, so I'm not getting into those details, you know, but I'm going to focus here. Now you would have something known as tie beams here. Okay, these are the time beams or what we call plinth beam. However, so this is one of the sections I had drawn. Okay, these are the your tie beam or at the plinth level, but there is no slab casted here. Okay, you would just, uh, you know, consolidate the soil and you would do direct flooring here. And this would classify as hollow plinth. Okay, there is no, there is no slab casted at this level. And, and, and it's called hollow because your floor is not starting from here your first technically your first slab is somewhere here okay this is where your slab is okay so <clears throat> what it means is uh, your ground floor is here at 2.8 meter this is technically zero this is floor one ground floor and so you have these columns here below the building, which can be used for parking. It can also be used for cl club areas, amenities, two things like that. And this part is not counted towards the FSI. It is counted towards the built up and super built up, but it is not counted towards the FSI. Okay, so that's what hollow plinth means. Hollow plane. Anybody has any question? Shall I stop this? Go back. Yes, sir. Okay. Are we back on the same slide? Okay. So now, yes, Steve, you have a question? No, right? Okay. So uh, then let's go ahead. All the interior open spaces and ducts 
so if you are providing any open ducts in the building for plumbing purposes uh, all those ducts are exempt uh, from the fsi calculation basements exclusively used for parking with a clear height of 2.6 meters excluding beam that is beam bottoms right from beam bottom to the floor level uh, if it's up to 6 2.6 meter this basement will be considered for the fsi calculation for security cabin up to 4 meter square weather shade up to projection of 60 uh, centimeters this we talked about last time uh, the flower bed or the weather shade however you classify that and then there is this is interesting staircase with minimum intermediate landing weight equal to the width of the stair and the maximum landing width of the floor level shall be twice the width of the stair now this sounds so confusing so again i am going to draw something here and explain to you let me clear this out so uh if you have a very simple dog leg staircase, let's let's assume a dog leg staircase. So again, let's say this is your stair, and again I'm using MS Paint to draw, so please don't challenge my drawing skills here. Okay, this is your typical dog leg staircase. I mean, I'm taking a case of dog leg staircase because it is a little easier to understand. I'll just skip the information. This is your stair. So, this is your landing. Okay, this is your landing. Again, this is also your landing. These both are. This is an intermediate landing, or this is the let's say floor level landing. This is your intermediate landing. Okay. And sir, your screen is not visible. Are you sure? Okay. Yes, sir. Now, is it visible now? Thank you. Can you guys see? Yeah, now. Okay. Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Okay, thank you for letting me know. I did not click the share button. So, uh, this is your intermediate landing, this is your floor level landing, and this is a typical dog leg staircase. And I'm going to draw, I'm going to draw something more here. Okay. And I'm going to draw. Please mind the scale because I'm not sure about the scale here, but I'm just trying to explain something. So, uh, your width of the staircase would be this. This is your width of the stair. Okay. This is the width of your stair. Right? And so, I'll redraw that. This would be your width of stair. Let's call it X. So, in that case, your landing width, which is this, this cannot X. So, this cannot exceed X. This has to be x as well. And the length of the landing, which is this, this can be 2x times the x. Okay. So if you have this scenario where you have constructed a staircase like this, where this is also x. Okay. 
x x 2 x then this entire area of the staircase and the landing will be exempt from uh, FSI. And here, what I have drawn is a lift duct. And so, this is typically your lift. Okay. These are your lift. This is a lift duct. And again, this lift duct also has a certain width. Okay. And this width, we'll call it Y. Okay, we'll call this Y. And the area of landing or foyer you would have outside your lift, even if that is Y, this is also not counted towards the FSI. So technically this line does not exist in your drawing. Okay. But if you have such a scenario, where you have a floor level landing, the lift waiting area and intermediate landing. This entire chunk of what you see right from the ground floor to the first floor will not be counted towards the FSI. However, if you get creative and if you decide to have a larger intermediate landing and if you decide to have you know a very different kind of a staircase with an open duct here okay. if you have an open duct here okay and if this is your stair the scenario will change what will happen is that now your x will be reduced uh, this would be your x, right? This would be your x. And so that would be only till here, which means that this much portion, this area right from ground floor to the top floor, this is additional. This will be then counted towards your FSI and so that is the reason why we have very rigid and non-creative design in the residential apartment because everybody is trying to maximize the FSI use. Any questions on this? This will be counted towards FSI if you are doing this kind of a design where this is a cutout. Essentially, any questions, guys? You understood this clearly? Yes, sir. Understood. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, so I'll stop this. Are we back on that slide again? Just tell me if you can't see this. So that was the explanation. Yeah, so that was the explanation for the staircase. Uh, it is a little complicated, uh, not for you guys because you are civil engineers, but for common people, this is very difficult to understand as a bylaw. Okay. Then the lift, lift well, lift cabin, stair cabin, lift landing or lift well. And the water tank, all this is uh, also exempt. Open air space slash chalk required under the regulation in the walled city. So, if you're providing a central open space, a central courtyard, if you've seen the old pole housing, you know it has this open to sky uh, central space, you know, like Havelis also have it. That is not also, that area is also not counted towards FSI. And if you're providing uh, electricity room as per the specifications of AEC, GEP, that is not included in the FSI. Right? So, those were the 10 things.
and then uh, i'm going to share this presentation with you it has the hierarchy of uh, the amc in order okay uh, so uh, I'll, i'll just very quickly go through this the hierarchy of order and who are the people now i'm not going to spend a lot of time you can read this but then there is a chairman there is a ca under him there is a senior town planner a deputy collector engineer estate officer pro person they have staff uh, the estate officer has you no know, reservation slots everything uh, so they have certain responsibilities of what they do if you visit the corporation side you will get some of these details but you will not exactly get this hierarchy uh, for us what is important is who is under the senior town planner and you will have a deputy town planner the drawing branch the survey branch and the assistant town planner and these are the people who actually draw the town planning schemes and they are responsible for completing the town planning scheme at least on paper so the drawing branch has draftsmen who are drafting it in autocad and gis software or tracer or draftsmen and the numbers in the brackets are how many people are there now this presentation uh, data i have from 2012 to be honest i have not updated it but if you take the case of amdavad municipal corporation the numbers have gone up the hierarchy has not changed but now they have probably 15 operators uh, instead of 5 and uh, any survey that is required like remeasurement of your plot or all the pluralite surveys on levels and what is the area all that is done by the survey branch the drawing branch draws them and then there is the assistant town planner and they are responsible for uh, the physical demarcation of the town planning scheme how much open space is required residential commercial pws housing spaces and then they will be in connection with the drawing people and explaining how exactly the tpp takes place so that's the uh, basic uh, uh, you know hierarchy of the mc but if you look at the approval uh, hierarchy uh, okay so this is this is a clear demarcation you have a mayor deputy mayor and corporators who are elected and so they don't play to much role in approval this is where they stop uh, of course they are in charge of taxes and collection but uh, their authority pretty much is limited while uh, the designated deputy municipal corporation and the deputy commissioner they handle a lot of responsibility and under them you have the pro the tax department the engineering department garden department health department the opter now opter does not exist i still put it uh, uh, after gst opter is a limit gone uh, then there is a estate department and the town planning department and so we we'll look at what the town planning department has and uh, in the town planning department there is a deputy commissioner under him there is a deputy commissioner for a zone if there are five zones like AMC has there are five different deputy commissioners, and under them you have the different town planning officer, the chief town planner. Uh, you guys know where chief town planner sits, right? Uh, the drawing department has inspectors. So this is the basic hierarchy, and uh, it would help you guys to understand what role each one of them plays, because getting your plans approved. from this authority is a big task and you know there are specialized jobs for this uh, now of course your plan sanctioning happens online but still there are there is a lot of legwork required where you have to go if you are doing a project you have to meet the right people if your file is stuck somewhere uh, that it ka sign baaki hai and you have to take signature of that person and that person is not approved so you have to Practically go across 
12 15 tables uh, before your project is signaled uh, as a green light okay let's can start getting the development getting a development permission you have to go to a 12 to 15 tables again uh, finally when your project is over even getting a building use permission or new permission again you have to uh, go to 5 6 tables so that's the reason why i showed that uh, thing to you. and then there is a huge plan uh, passing process the approval now this has gone online since i made this so uh, it's not like you have to physically go there but still all this progress reports and different forms are there you need to upload it on the website uh, of the portal and so it's a huge detail i will really not get into you can read it there is a form key you require to fill out you need to fill out all these certificates there is an extra for structural engineer you have to get various affidavits appointment of different professionals appointment of architect and you need to have a separate affidavit for parking you need a bond for formation of the society again this is a tri-party agreement that who is the builder or the developer who is a constructor who is going to construct what the society is many times the constructor and the builder are the same but you need separate two entities you need to form two different companies as to who is marketing the project and who is, uh, who is constructing the person who is marketing the project will be required to get all the permission and the person who is constructing it of course will be constructing it so construction completion is in that person hand and the third entity is the society itself uh, sir yes uh, sir sir we have uh, another lecture at 10 so uh, okay so i think we'll have to stop now and i will continue from here uh, any any questions you guys have or you guys just want to leave uh, sir can we extend the date of uh, this uh, assignment yes sir, yes, sir. Well, I am yes, no, no. I am required to submit your internal mark, including the project mark, by the 16th. Sir, but nowadays we having a back to back meeting like all the days, so we can't able to work on your project. I understand nowadays. that, but I, that is the reason why I give the project earlier. I think the only thing should be left now is your finance. Your assignment one and two. Is you sixty percent of your project done, right? And now all that is required is the cash flow analysis, uh, which is again a two-hour exercise. Last Thursday, we have a rose wood lecture. Uh, well, I am. I'm it is a very five-hour lecture. It is difficult to extend because I have to give internal uh, evaluation. Try to complete by the fifteen. Maybe I can give you. Uh, one more day, uh, but it's not going to help because I have to give your internal marks by the day. So, uh, you will have to finish by the 15th. I'm so sorry. I wish you had asked me earlier. I would have uh, taken earlier classes of finance first uh, before completing the seal deeds and all that so that you could have completed the project. But I thought you are pretty good. We also didn't know, but the lecture started suddenly from last week. All the lectures. So suddenly, yes. fair finance lecture started. Yeah, I understand, but you will have to juggle with this because uh, unfortunately, just like me, every faculty has the same pressure, and so uh, I cannot give you any explanation on the project. Just try to keep things. We will also give your lectures at six. Okay, we'll discuss this in the WhatsApp group. I think we'll uh, have a meeting because uh, you have other classes. Okay, uh, we'll discuss this yes, on our yes. WhatsApp group and on phone. Okay, guys. Yes, okay. Right. okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you. See you, I'll see you, you on uh, Friday. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Thank <laughs> you.